Welcome back, everybody, to the Bucks Planet Podcast. I am, of course, your host, Will Neely, and it is time to give a formal welcoming to the Bucks 2020 NFL Draft Class. And that's entirely what this podcast is going to be about, breaking down all the picks, what I think, and you know if they were good, if they were bad. And we even have some Jameis News signing with the Saints. We're definitely going to touch on that a little bit, too, after we talk about the draft. And, yeah, so let's just go ahead and get started with the first pick. The Bucks take tackle Tristan Wirfs out of the University of Iowa. <clears throat> now, this was, an, this was interesting how he fell to us. A lot of mock drafts did not have him falling to us because there was four great tackles in the draft. There was Jedrick Wills, Andrew Thomas, Mekhi Becton, and Tristan Wirfs. Those were like the four first-round talent tackles. And what we desperately needed one of them because we did not re-sign DeMar Dotson. And even if we did re-sign DeMar Dotson, he sucks, so we would have needed a new one anyway. And we saved money by cutting. So the whole operation was just good. We needed a tackle. This was the year to take a tackle. Jason Light doesn't like to pick offensive linemen, but good thing that Bruce Arians does because we we got one this draft. Now, a lot of people kind of overrated Worfs a little bit. And the, after the combine, because Tristan Wirfs had the best combine performance, arguably, ever from any offensive lineman. He ran a 4.8340. His vertical was insane. I mean, there's a video of him jumping out of a pool, jumping out of a pool when he's you know up to up to his uh, his neck in water, and he just vertically jumps out of the pool, pulling all of his 320 pound weight with him. I mean, that's that's crazy. That's stuff that you just really don't see. And so he's definitely like the most athletically gifted of the entire tackle class. But it's interesting that he was taken fourth. If that could have a combine and the hype and all these things, why was he taken? Why was he the fourth tackle taken, and not the first or the second or something? And it's interesting because th- that's kind of how I saw him too. He's this is a good pick. Like I'll just say right now, this is a very good pick. I am ecstatic that he actually fell to us. And we didn't have to trade up to the top 10 to get him because we kind of lucked out with Isaiah Simmons being there and the Cardinals take him instead of a tackle like a lot of people thought they were. And <clears throat> so then since the Cardinals didn't take a tackle, then, you know, the Browns and the Jets did like everyone thought. And then, you know, there was there was one left for us because the Giants took one too. And the way I saw Worfs and I watched his film when I watched – people talking about his film and I, I've, I've seen mostly everything about all these tackles I don't know if Worfs is the fourth best but I certainly know he's not the best he here he wasn't the best because he does have a little bit of a sloppy technique and this happens to players that are very athletically gifted they get a little sloppy in their techniques and they can kind of get away with it because it's college football in the NFL you can't get away with it so I could see the concern of why he didn't go top 10 wasn't the first tackle off the board like for instance, his raw strength. I mean, I think he put up the most at the at the forty, the most bench. Or I'm sorry, I think he put up the most bench presses at the combine. I think I believe so. And he just has so much raw strength and is athletically gifted that his technique coming out of the off the ball and the way he would attack defenders was a little sloppy sometimes because he would just rely on pure strength. It was the same thing with Vita Vey when he came out. Vita Vey's technique and his hand placement was a little sloppy sometimes because he was just so much stronger than every other player he played against. He could just go right through the offensive line and sack the quarterback. In the NFL, his rookie year, he had a terrible rookie year. And, you know, he he fixed a lot of it last year, and he realized that you can't just rely on pure strength because all of them are strong in the NFL. And that's something that Worfs is going to have to handle because one big problem with him is his the way he gets off the ball is a little concerning because mostly he's he's a tackle, okay? For people that don't know what offensive tackles are, there's if you're if you're looking at if you're from the quarterback's perspective, okay, and you're in the shotgun and you're looking at all those big guys in front of you, the guy right in front of you is the center, the person on the right and the person on the left of the center is the right and left guard, the person on the right of the guard and the person on the left of the other guard is the right and left tackle. And those positions are very important because they protect the quarterback's blind side. They, they block the edge rushers. So if you have a right-handed quarterback, he's not going to see the edge rusher coming that the left tackle is supposed to be blocking. So it's a very important position. 
and we could move worse over to left tackle and move Donovan over to right tackle. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to have to see. But anyways, it's a very important position, and it is why that they would, that these four tackles were taken in the top, all of them were taken in the top 15. But anyways, the way that Tristan Wurst get off, gets off the ball is a little slow. In fact, it's almost concerningly slow. And because what he intends to do, if you watch film, you can see this. When the ball is snapped, he takes about two kind of mini steps right off the ball and then just kind of takes one big step and then kind of lunges at whoever he's supposed to be blocking. While a normal left tackle, this is kind of hard to explain without showing, but uh, hopefully we can be able to do that eventually once I get a little bit uh, smarter about how to run this operation here. But uh, a normal tackle will take two big steps right off the ball and will have his shoulders not all the way perpendicular to the line of scrimmage, but a little bit, and then give a good block. And the... The really the ideal with this whole, with that, with with Andrew or uh, with Tristan Worf's uh, get off the ball stance is because it puts him in a position to not have good leverage against certain types of pass rushers in the NFL. Because if your shoulders are completely uh, perpendicular and vertical to the line of scrimmage, and you're facing the guy, if a defensive end is pushing you. That defensive end has all the advantage because he's coming in at an angle, right? He's coming in at an at an angle while you're completely vertical to the line of scrimmage, and it makes a power move, like, you know, a stiff arm, cut in, or just bull rush all the way to the quarterback. It makes it a lot easier for an edge rusher to be able to do that if an offensive lineman's stance and their shoulders are completely perpendicular to the line of scrimmage. But... At Iowa, Worf was able to get away with this because he was just stronger than everybody else. I mean, you know, once he comes to to Tampa, I mean, he's going to have to face defensive ends like Cameron Jordan, all pro. You know, he's going to have – we play the Raiders next year, and uh, – well, I guess he's – yeah, well, and he's going to – we're going to play – I guess I forgot Khalil Max not on the Raiders, but uh, – it's my bad on that. But – and there's so many other good defensive ends, and especially, you know, the Panthers – they just drafted, you know, a defensive tackle and a defensive end in the draft. And even just the average defensive end, edge rusher in the NFL, is just so much stronger and better than than uh, the, all the ones he faced in college. So the technique is really going to have to improve now that he is in the NFL. But the good news is, is these, the, uh, these like, technique issues that he is having is not unfixable. They're, it's actually very fixable. We just... And I have, I feel very confident in our coaching. If he was drafted, you know, at the cutter, uh, the, the cutter regime or the Lovey Smith regime, especially that regime, or really any regime ever, but uh, before Bruce Arians, or and then Tony Dungy. I mean, look, if he would have been drafted with those guys, I would be less confident that we could fix it because with good coaching, he can fix his technique issues, and you can honestly develop him to be a Hall of Fame caliber tackle because that's that's what everyone's saying. I mean, this guy has is so athletic. He, he can runs a four eight three. He can get out there on screen pra, screen passes. He can get upfield on 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 run blocking. I mean, this guy is someone that you would want on your team. And now, if he just fixes the technique issues, he will be fully able to reach his potential because Worf probably has the highest potential out of all of the tackles. That's the thing. Jedrick Wills is probably just the best, can't go wrong, guaranteed starter, and some of the other guys are too. But the highest ceiling would definitely go to Tristan Wurst because of his athletic ability if he can just clean up his techniques. And since he was drafted under the Arians regime, and he, we have really good coaching now, a good offensive line coach, and you know obviously a great head coach, good off, uh, kind of decent offensive coordinator, but he won't be dealing with that as much. And I believe that we can coach Wurst's technique to be better to fit a more NFL-style blocking scheme if that makes any sense to you guys it's offensive linemen it's kind of boring to watch film on them and it's boring to hear people talk about watching film on them but since everyone pretty much knew we were going to watch uh or we were going to take a tackle this year I, I did my due diligence I watched hours of people talking about his film you know all of his games I, I did most of all of that and that's basically the thing that I've come to discover is that his technique isn't great it puts himself in not the best of situations 
But this guy is an absolute stud. I mean, the potential is, you know, off the off the roof here, but or off the charts. But um, and I know it's kind of confusing because it's like, well, we need to draft for now, so we don't need to be we don't need guys with like the highest potential. We need someone who can come in here now. But and I agree with that. But we didn't really have a choice. We did not trade up into the top ten. We had to select the best tackle available, and that was worse. And at least we got one of the top four guys. So that's. That's what I, my opinion on that. I give that pick an A, but there was something else about that pick that I cannot just not discuss. We traded up one pick to the 49ers to select him, and a lot of people don't understand why, including myself. There's uh, There's been a lot because the, t- the, the 49ers weren't going to take a tackle. I mean, no one thought they were. I mean, maybe some people thought they were because Joe Stanley's getting old, and they did just trade for Trent Williams. I mean, it's evidence that they maybe would have taken a tackle. But I honestly think that, be, and then a lot of people say that, oh, the Dolphins and some other teams are trying to trade up with the 49ers to select Worfs because everyone knew we were going to select them one pick later. And if that's the case, then I do support the trade um, because you have to go up and get your guy. You can't just sit and wait. You have to go up and actually do something to get your guy. And, you know, if there's one thing with us, we're known to just sit there and wait because I can just go back in the draft. We wanted to pick Jalen Ramsey. We waited, didn't trade up. He gets picked two picks before us. We're stuck with Hargraves. Bust. You know, we wanted to pick, I think, Quentin Nelson a couple years ago. He gets picked one pick before us. We end up having to stick with Vita Vey, not as good of a football player. You know, and now we're still having to draft an offensive lineman in the first round. So if there's one thing the NFL draft proves, is you, it's better to be safe than sorry. And... You have to go up and get your guy. You cannot just sit there because other teams don't have the same philosophy as you, and they're going to go up and get their guy if you don't. So there's no reason to just sit there if you even have the slightest inkling that someone is going to take them right before you. And I think that's what Bruce Aarons and Jason Light did. So the trade doesn't fully irritate me, even though it is kind of like, oh, did we really need to? We gave up a fourth rounder. We had two for fourth rounders, gave up one for Gronk and gave up – this one to the 49ers after we trade up one spot. We had to do it. If the, if we really thought that another team was going to take worse, I understand why we did it. But to be honest here, we're never going to really know why we traded up. If it was just light kind of being an idiot like normal, which wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise, shouldn't surprise anyone on this podcast. He was just being paranoid. Or if they actually had legitimate inside you know, information that, that either the 49ers or the Dolphins were going to take them if they did a trade. So, you know, we'll, we'll never truly know, but that's that's my take on that trade. Now, in the second round, a lot of people, including myself, thought we were going to take a running back. A lot of people thought we were. And we had pretty much the whole selection except Clyde edwards Elayer, who went to the Chiefs late in the first round. Well, actually, the last pick in the first round. And we had the choice of Akers and Dobbins. And, yeah, granted, Taylor was gone. Um, Jonathan Taylor, who apparently we wanted. So maybe because Taylor was gone, we decided not to pick a running back. But anyway, we still had Akers and, Do- and uh, Dobbins on the board. And we kind of went with uh, someone that people didn't really think we'd pick. You know, Antoine Winfield Jr., a safety out of Minnesota. And where have we seen this before? Defensive back, second round, Bucks. I mean, it's like bread and butter. If it's if we have a second round pick, he can guarantee it's on the defensive back side. Light can't help himself. I call it the run on DBs. And the problem with Jason Light, and this has been my biggest, like I can't stand Jason Light, is the run on DBs. Because if you make a run on DBs, you should only have to do that once. But because Jason Light's not good at drafting, we have to keep doing it every year because we keep picking bad players. So then you have to readdress the same positions the next year. And, I mean, he's been doing this for about four years, and yet we're still taking DBs in the second round. I'm not surprised. I'm honestly not surprised. However, with all of that being said, I do like the pick. I actually do. We've had we've picked so many bad safeties. I mean, I made this, I made this picture of, of all the safeties that we've drafted that are bad. We got Mark Barron, Justin Evans, Keith Tandy. You know, I mean, the, the whole – and. MJ Stewart. It's just, it, it's frustrating because we should at this point under Jason Light's tenure have this entire, 
you know, we, we should have this our entire secondary fixed at this point since we all we do is draft secondary, and yet it's still bad every year. But I've I've read some things about this guy. I've watched uh, some of his some of his games, and the, I do believe this safety I think will break the streak. It, you know, I don't I, I know I'm, I'm usually kind of negative on the show, but it's not even really negative. It's just I'm realistic, and everyone else is just not realistic. So I mean, we have to. There's a little bit of dis- disagreement between me and everyone else, but I actually do. I'm actually pretty hopeful about the safety. I think he will break the curse of us never being able to draft a good safety since John Lynch. I really do think that uh, he will be good. I mean, he's short. He kind of he kind of me- measures up to Tyron Matthew, the Honey Badger. I think they're similar. He's got great instincts, fast, elusive. You know, he's kind of a ball hawk when it's in the air. Um, unlike you know a lot of our other players, I don't even know what the, what's happening when the ball's in the air. But uh, he covers good. And honestly, with safety, you the biggest thing about safety is just the instincts. And it's something that's kind of hard to coach that you really just, you either get it or you don't get it. You know, like, because safeties, for those that don't know, they play in the very back of the defense and they usually get a zone to cover deep balls. But sometimes, you know, they get up for blitzes, other things, different coverage packages, depending on what they're playing. But most of the time, they're just covering the deep balls. And sometimes there's two safeties, one safety. And um, the you need a good instincts as a safety because a lot of the times quarterbacks, all they do is try to just move their eyes around the field to shift a safety from one side of the field to the other. And great safeties like Tyron Matthew and you know the Cam Chancellors, the Earl Thomases, the old John Lynches, they have a unique ability to not be fooled by quarterback's eye movement, and they can just recognize plays, route concepts, see what the pick plays are, and what the quarterback is thinking. Because if you're a safety, you're pretty much the quarterback thinking of the defense. If you if you can become a safety that can really say, okay, if I was a quarterback, what would I be looking at right now? What would I be trying to make myself do right now so I could make a good pass and a wide-open receiver? And if a safety can think like a quarterback and know what he's trying to do, you will be a great safety because you can cut off routes, you can recognize plays, you can, you know, bait quarterbacks into throwing things that you might they might think are open, but then you come over quickly and, and shut that down. And speed is very important for safety. You're gonna have to go across the field, cover deep balls, tackle the runs. It's it's the safety is a very important position in the secondary. And <clears throat> I think this this guy seems to kind of have it. He kind of seems to have the 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 instincts that I'm looking for that a lot of people like MJ Stewart and Justin Evans, they just kind of do the basic thing. They don't go that deep. And that's pretty much what they're, you know, that's the only thing they're good for. This guy I do think has the instincts. Now, I might be wrong. You know, the transition to NFL, I mean, the game is just so much more complicated. I think there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve, I'm sure. I just really hope that this guy can end the streak of bad DBs and elevate our defense to the next level. Third round. I was a little disappointed. This is this is where the draft starts to tank a little. Not tank, but it, it dips a little bit for me because I wanted us to trade up in the second round again to select either Cam Akers or J.K. Dobbins because I really think those are the most, you know, start right that can start right now and make a difference for your offense. And, um, you know, we let we, we didn't do that. We let both of them be taken. And in the third round, we pick a running back named Keyshawn Vaughn from Vanderbilt. Transferred from Illinois after playing there for two years and then played at Vanderbilt for two years before declaring for the draft. I've read a ton of things about this pick. Apparently, everyone says we picked him around too early. And... I've, I've, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say things that I don't know. I've never, I don't even know who this guy is. I mean... You know, I, I looked him up. I started watching some of his highlights, some of his films, some of his games, what people are saying about him, what people say about his film. So I've done my research now, but when we picked him, I was like, Keyshawn Vaughn? Keyshawn Vaughn. Huh? But after doing my evaluation, I mean, it, he really just, he doesn't seem like he's like that explosive, big play kind of running back that, you know, all of us fans kind of want to have that maybe a Cam Akers or a J.K. Dobbins or Jonathan Taylor would have been. But this guy does seem his biggest strengths I, I that I've read is catching the ball out of the backfield, which is good, and pass protection, which is 
in a way, this is kind of exactly what we needed. It's not the flashy pick. It's not the, you know, the greatest pick, uh, you know, the home run hitter pick. But this guy does ex is exactly what I said when I said we needed a Tom Brady running back. He can catch the ball out of the backfield, and he's smart at pass protection. All the things Ronald Jones isn't. So this could be a nice compliment to him. So this, I'll give this pick maybe a B minus or a C plus. Well, actually, I mean, it could be a, a solid pick. I just think we picked him around too early, and I, I don't think that he's going to be like a super all-pro standout. I mean, it is a third-round pick, granted, but still, I think we should have traded up and picked Dobbins or Akers in the second round. Now, in the fifth round, we picked because, you know, we had two fourth-rounders. Where, where did those go, Jason? Oh, uh, yeah, one of them went to a tight end that we didn't need, and the other one went to the 49ers because we overreacted. But that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. In the, the fifth round, we picked a wide receiver named Tyler Johnson. Okay, and you Lightning fans out there, I know it's going to drive you crazy. There's now two jo Tyler Johnson athletes in Tampa. Okay, get used to it. And I... I actually really, really like this Tyler Johnson pick. Now, if I, I said before the draft, if you're going to pick a wide receiver, we need a burner. We don't really have anyone that can actually stretch the field. Evans is a you know big body, tall, you know goes up there, gets the ball. Goblin's a good route runner, medium size, but none of them really have you know track speed, and we need a guy with track speed. And Tyler Johnson does not have track speed. That was in fact his one weakness coming out of here, but I've watched film now on this guy, and I can tell you right now that this guy, to me, looks like the next, the next Chris Goblin. I mean, he runs good routes. He has great, great hands. He's 6'2 and a half. That's basically the same size as Goblin already, and I think this guy's a solid pick. I think he can serve in the slot, um, and, you know, Scotty Miller can run, a, can run very fast, so maybe he'll be our track speed guy, um, but I, I actually do like the Tyler Johnson pick out of Minnesota. So we now pick the safety out of Minnesota, the wide receiver out of Minnesota. So we clearly like the University of Minnesota this year. And then this is kind of when it gets to the more irrelevant parts of the draft to get to around sixth and seven. And I know it's kind of ironic because our quarterback, who's a Hall of Famer, is drafted in the sixth round, but that's just an anomaly. We picked Khalil Davis out of Nebraska, uh, defensive tackle, and the sixth round. And, I mean, this is just another, you know, try to see out if he can make the team. Could be a rotational guy. Could be a uh, – because he's not, he's not going to start. I mean, we have Vita Vade and Amik and Sue. I mean, he's, he's not going to start, obviously, if he makes the team. I mean, this could just be for depth, honestly. You can never have enough defensive linemen. You can never have enough offensive linemen. But especially defensive linemen. You can never have enough of them. And then in the seventh round, we picked Chappelle Russell, who was a linebacker from Temple. And all, we had two seventh-round picks. The other guy we picked uh, is named R a running back named Raymond Calais. And I actually really like both of these picks because we actually did something that we normally don't do. We drafted for special teams. And I understand, besides the kicker, besides drafting kickers, we normally don't draft for special teams. It's kind of kind of weird. But I really think this the linebacker is just going to be, you know, one of those gunners on special teams that can – you know, go out, make a tackle, be on the field goal unit. Just one of those type of guys, maybe the kickoff unit too. And But the Raymond Calais pick, this guy ran, I think, the third or the second highest or second fastest 40 time. It was like a 4-4-1. That's track speed. That's what a good returner would need. So I actually believe that Raymond Calais is going to be our kick returner slash punt returner, and that would be fan. Fantastic, because the one thing I've wanted is a good kick returner because it makes a difference in a game. People don't think it does. It actually does make a difference in a game. You know, getting the ball at the, at the you know, if they, let's say they punt it and you field it at the, the 25, you know, the difference between, you know, just getting that two yards and getting tackled at the 27 and then getting 20 yards at the, at the 45, almost midfield, that makes so much of a difference. You're two first downs away from a, a field goal. And that's 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 great. And we haven't had a very fast returner in so long, a very good returner in so long. I mean, hopefully this is good, goodbye to Goomba Wale, otherwise known as a Goomba idiot on this show. And I'm just very I'm very content with that pick. And uh, so overall, I would say this draft would be a a solid B to B plus because of the fact that I don't really know about Vaughn, and we didn't get a speedy wide receiver. But I do think the the worst pick is good. I like the safety we got. 
but again, this is just one of those things only time will tell if they are actually good or not. But that is my opinion so far. Now, one last thing before we wrap it up. Jameis Winston today signed with the New Orleans Saints. I mean, it's 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 so tough to see. It really is, especially as us Jameis fans. I mean, <laughs> we hate the Saints, and now he's a Saint. I mean, it's like out of all teams, like why couldn't you have gone to the AFC on some random team, and then we basically don't have to play you. You can just do your own thing. But now he signs with our division rival, the New Orleans Saints. Now, granted, he does get to sit behind Drew Brees, get coached by Sean Payton, and I, I, I hate the guy, but, I mean, I guess he's a decent coach for quarterbacks. I mean, he's you know, a Hall of Famer right now, but uh, we don't like to compliment him too much because he's just a scumbag, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give him that, I guess. And so for Jameis, I could see how – it's an attractive look for him. It's probably his, his personally best case scenario, but it does kind of irritate us fans. And for those longtime fans, we know that when we give up quarterbacks too early, they just go on to become Hall of Famers, like uh, Trent Dilfer. Well, he obviously, he's not a Hall of Famer, but they become like a lot better than they played for us, like uh, you know Steve Young, you know Doug Williams went on to win a Super Bowl. Trent Dilfer. I mean, so many of these guys just go on to be so much better than they were here. And a lot of a lot of Bucks fans are concerned it's going to happen with Jameis under a, like a better organization, and that could happen. I really hope it doesn't, but I do wish Jameis the best. It's just so frustrating seeing him in, in black and gold. It's the kids. I mean, it's the color of my high school uniforms, and I don't even like my high school uniforms. Because every time I watch my high school football team play, I think I'm watching the Saints, and then I get irritated. So it's very frustrating to see, but. I am glad that he got signed. And, I mean, are we surprised that he got signed before Cam Newton? No. Cam Newton's bad. I don't care. Oh, well, it's because he's injured. He's just bad. I don't care that he's injured. He's also, like, just not good at football. I mean, if – I mean, oh, he would have been signed by now as a backup if people thought he was at least semi-good. But clearly he hasn't. I mean, maybe he's gotten some offers and decline, but Cam Newton's not that good. I mean, I would take Jameis any day of the week over Cam Newton – Cam Newton still does not have a job, and that's pretty much that's pretty much that with with Cam. I mean, he's definitely not getting a starting job, I don't think. And I, I'm trying to think right now of a team you'd sign for the Patriots, right? But I mean, do you think Cam Newton is going to get along with, or do you think Bill Belichick's going to get along with Cam Newton? No, I mean the way he dresses, the way he acts, his accuracy problems. I mean that is just all would drive. Bill Belichick up a wall. I mean, I'm sure I'm pretty sure Bill Belichick would rather stick with the fourth round pick Jared Stidham or Brian Hoyer, their career backup quarterback, than Cam Newton. I mean, I would too. I don't blame him. But yeah, this this is gonna do it for the the Bucks 2020 draft class. I give this to a B. I give this a B to a B plus. I think that's a fair assessment based off of everything I've said. And you know, this might be the last podcast for a while because there's uh, unless something you know breaking news happens or something, but uh, you know, there's not there's not much else to talk about. Uh, you know, especially this whole COVID thing going on. You know, OTAs are going to be weird this year. I mean, they're going to have to do it online. It's it's going to be odd for sure. And you know, the there's basically no new news until training camp. But obviously, I'm going to make one. From you know what what day is today April twenty six, and is that'd be crazy to think I want to make another one until August, but there's not going to be much news coming out. So you know we're gonna have to play this by ear. I'll try to think of something to talk about for you guys, but uh, yeah, for now, you know this might be it for a, a little bit, and uh, yeah, B plus draft, B to B plus draft, and I will see you guys next time.